Welcome to Activism Munich. I'm Zen Reza from Munich, Germany. Today we're joined by Matt Barlow. She's a Canadian author and activist. She's the recipient of 11 honorary doctorates as well as numerous awards. She received the Right Livelihood Award, as also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for a long-standing and successful work on trade and social justice issues with a special focus on water. She has authored and co-authored 17 books which have covered a wide range of issues which include globalization and free trade, human rights, healthcare, and the global water crisis. Her recent book is called Blue Future, Protecting Water for People and the Planet Forever. Bart Balo, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So um, let's start with the basics. How would you define water in terms of how the public should view it? And what are the issues confronting it? Well, the basic two issues that are the most immediate are the ecological crisis. We're actually a planet running out of water, even though, <clears throat> I don't know, back in grade school, we all learned that wasn't possible. It was a finite amount of water. It goes round and round in the hydrologic cycle, we were told. And, you know, you, maybe you can pollute it, but it's still always there. But in fact, we are a planet running out of accessible clean water. Um, we're damming rivers. We're um, pulling up uh, ancient groundwater using borewell technology that's just destroying groundwater around the world. <clears throat> and we're displacing and mismanaging the world's water system at a really alarming rate. One recent international study said that by 2030, um, the, sub the demand for water in our world will outstrip supply by 40%. So and it is really a dire crisis. It's the first phase of climate change, actually. On the other hand, we have a human crisis, and that is that we have still a great amount of poverty in the world. We still have a great amount of um, inequity and inequality and injustice in the world. And if you put lack of clean water and injustice and poverty together, you get people without access to clean water and sanitation. About a billion people don't have drinking water and about 2.5 billion um, don't have any sanitation. They defecate in the open still in our world. So what I've been trying to build is a movement that brings these together, because I find these tend to be two silos, the people working on the science and environment, the people working on human rights and, and development, um, to say that we have to build a movement to put water at the center of our lives and all policy, and that we must see water as a human right and a public trust. It belongs to all of us. It belongs to the future. It belongs to the ecosystem. It must never be allowed to be privatized, sold, traded, hoarded, put on the open market for sale. Because if it if it's allowed to do that, even more than currently exists, um, we're going to find more and more people will die with for lack of, of water. You've talked a lot about the formation of a global water cartel. For many, that would be unimaginable, given that we live um, in a free market economy, globalized in a globalized sense, and that the government would intervene for the public interest. Um, could you elaborate on, on this global cut water cartel that you talk about? Well, first of all, the, glo the, the government's already intervened on behalf of the public. Most water systems in this world are still public. They're run by public agencies on a not-for-profit basis. That's, that's quite typical. Um, what these cartels want, what these corporate giants want, is for serv water services to be delivered on a for-profit basis. So the World Bank has been telling poorer countries, if you want funding for... Um, uh, water services, you have to go to what's called public-private partnerships and bring in these corporations. Sometimes you get governments, federal governments, saying to their municipality the same thing. If you want funding, you, you know, we're moving you to the private sector. But really, it's not so much that it's already a cartel and we're asking governments to intervene. It's already a public service, and we're trying to stop the cartels from taking over the water systems. Uh, policymakers routinely employ rhetoric um which kind of gives us the sense of urgency and the need to make immediate reforms, be it global warming, food and water crisis, terrorism, or regional conflicts. But when push comes to shove, um, little or no action is undertaken. And um, could you tell us which countries and the names of leaders which have actually undertaken those reforms which have brought about change and those countries and leaders which have um, done quite the opposite? I can't point to any country and leader that I can say has done all the right things around water. In fact, 
I can tell you that probably no leader has done what we need to do on water. Um, from the leadership point of view, we need governments to recognize that water is a human right. Now that has happened at the United Nations, although many governments opposed it. Canada, my government opposed it. The United States opposed it and so on. Germany actually was very good and supported it. But um, so, so in that sense, the United Nations has done the right thing. So that is one really positive step. But individual governments and individual leaders, no, we don't tend to have a situation where, um, where I could turn and say they've done all the right things. They need to bring in legal protections for water, really strong protections against pollution, against overextraction on climate change. You know how far behind we are on catching the climate change uh, crisis. Um, we need governments to absolutely uh, rule that, that water has to be a public service for their people. So that's work, or at least fighting to maintain that where it exists. We need governments and leaders of all kinds. We need inter international institutions to say that water is a public trust and that it must be guarded fiercely as a commons um, and therefore have very strict rules about who gets access to it and what they do with it when they get access to it. And we need governments to govern on what we call watershed uh, basis instead of saying, well, here's a river and you've got some of it and I've got some of it and these guys have got some of it and we're going to fight over it. And we each want our share. What can we, how can we come together and govern in a way that is good for the whole watershed and, and good for the whole river? Can we change our minds around that? <clears throat> now saying that, I would say something positive about Europe, and that is that in 2000, Europe brought in a watershed, a European-wide watershed plan where all watersheds, no matter how many uh, political boundaries they cross, are governed on a watershed basis. So that, we already have some good laws and some good beginnings. But we're looking at the need for transnational and transboundary um, agreements to be based on the notion of ecosystem protection. And we're a long way from that. So I, I would say your opening statement that governments are failing to act on a lot of these issues, I would say the same is true for water. And I'm, I can talk about individual projects that are good, but not whole governments that are, are doing the absolute right thing. You've been a staunch activist against um, free trade and investment agreements globally. So um, free trade agreements such as the one that is being currently negotiated between the European Union and the United States known as the Transatlantic Free Trade and Investment Agreement um, has strong support from, from President Obama as well as our Chancellor Angela Merkel on the premise that it will boost jobs, growth, investment and also development. Um, what consequences do you think it would have on our water systems in Europe if this um, agreement was to be ratified? Well, first of all, you need to know that the one, the agreement you're talking about has been preceded by another agreement, and that's with Canada, and it's called CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. And as we speak right now, there's a signing, a ceremony in Ottawa, Canada, with uh, the European Union, the European Commissioner Barossa and our Prime Minister, um, but it isn't an easy sailing. Even Angela Merkel and and certainly um, the Social Democrats in the German Parliament are saying they will not sign this agreement or the one with the United States if they keep this investor state provision in. Investor state is where a corporation has the right to sue the government of another country um, if that government brings in any law or even enforces a law in a way that they can say, well, it's cost us the right to profit. It's cost us money. And we're totally opposed to the right of corporations to be able to dictate domestic laws to other countries. Um, and so um, we've been fighting CETA, and it's been really, really important that Germany uh, seems now to be saying we're not going to sign it in its current form, and they're not going to sign TTIP, the agreement with the United States, if it includes this clause for corporations. Uh, to be able to sue. The, um, the consequence for those kind of agreements we've lived with under the North American Free Trade Agreement in Canada, and right at the moment we have $2.5 billion, about just a little, about 1.8 billion euros worth of challenges from American corporations to Canadian laws 
things like one province brought in a moratorium on fracking and a big American company is challenging us and saying we don't have the right to do it. And why say we do have the right to do it? You have the right to pass laws that are good for your people, right? And, and you've elected a government to act in your behalf. And when they do, why is a foreign corporation allowed to sue? So we've got a big story to tell and it's been very bad for water. What happens is that if you go from a public to a private system, it's almost impossible to go back because the big companies can sue because they can say, well, you've changed the policy. Um, they, they allow corporations to actually sue for the actual water that they, they use in their operations. We actually have a case like that. Um, they can sue if, a, if, if a, a government is to say, well, you're all, you guys are all using too much water, like the oil companies, American oil companies operating in Canada are using too much water in the tar sands and the oil sands in Alberta. If the Alberta government were to say, well, we're cutting you back, they would have to do it, they'd have to obey the law, but they could seek co financial compensation uh, instead. So I, I, um, I think Europeans need to know and Germans need to know that if uh, these corporations get their way, they're going to be enforcing, moving and enforcing privatization of water services. They're going to be claiming water ownership in other countries. Um, and they're going to be, uh, uh, you know, basically dictating the, the conditions of working people, how much money, what happens when they privatize is they cut this, the working staff in, in half. and cut corners in terms of, of, uh, of the actual um, uh, delivery of, of good, clean water. So Europeans need to know that this trade agreement is not Europe versus North America. That's, not, that's a bad way to look at it. It's the big corporations of Europe and the big corporations of North America want to come together to lower the standards, the, what they call the non-tariff barriers. Um, and it's the people of Europe and the people of North America together who will be the victims. So it's really important that we understand that. I think there are two ways to look at um, this, when we come to the solution aspect of this issue. Either we accept the state capitalist system and its global form, what we refer to as new liberalism, and shape solutions within this framework, um, or we construct or revive alternative models and shape society and tackle issues such as water accordingly. So my question is, are reforms actually possible under the current globalized capitalist system that we have? Or um, do we require an alternative model to combat such issues? No, I don't, <clears throat> I don't believe that we can deal with the issues of inequality, climate change, water devastation under the current terms of neoliberalism. I just don't believe it's possible. That's not to say that I don't think there's a place for the private sector or markets. In my country, Canada, we used to have what we called a mixed economy when we would ask the question, what's the appropriate role for government and what's the appropriate role for the private sector and how do they work together? But the private sector wasn't allowed to take over and dictate public policy and there was lots of money for social programs and for, for public protection. So it was kind of a mix and in my mind, that worked really well. So I think we need to look for that kind of, of reform, um, not reform of the current system, but really truly new models that um, put human rights, that put justice, social and environmental justice, that put um, ecosystem protection right at the center of all of our policies. And one of the things I call for in my book is uh, a new water ethic. Um, where we, we ask whether it's trade policy or energy policy or agriculture policy, what is the impact on water of, of what we're doing here? And if the impact is bad, you scrap it or you go back to the drawing boards and you start again. So these are the kind of questions that we have to ask, not just about water, but about everything we're doing. Frankly, if the planet's to survive, because even if people don't care about other people, they should care about themselves and the ability to live in a, a world of dramatically diminishing resources. Lastly, for the people that are watching this interview and want to become a water warrior, to borrow your term, um, what can the individual do in terms of activism? What liter literature can he or she pick up or what organizations can he or she support? 
Well, they really want to support something local, um, and there are good water groups in in Munich and in in Germany and actually all over Europe. Um, there's um, there are people actively working. There's a, a group that's working to get signatures for a, a water a European wide referendum called the Citizens Initiative. There's another Citizens Initiative on CETA and TTIP if they want to get involved in the trades side of it. But it's really important to find out what's happening in your own local community and not just do it alone. I mean, everybody can do th some things. Give up bottled water. We don't need it. You've got clean water coming, good, clean, safe water coming out of your taps. Um, you know, change the way we use water at home. You know, be conscious of water. Uh, be conscious of pollution. I mean, all of these are things we can do alone, but that's not enough. Even if everybody does that individually, it's not enough. We need to come together to change to get our governments to change direction and change policies. We need the revolution, if you will, the, the alternatives. Um, and we're not going to get that by, you know, turning a, the water off when we brush our teeth. That's not going to make the revolution come, that's going, to, that's going to maybe save this much water, but we need to do more than that. And so there are wonderful groups fighting water privatization, fighting shale gas fracking, which is coming to a community near you. I promise you governments everywhere are looking at shale gas fracking, um, getting involved in these trade issues and becoming literate about trade. All of these are really important things to do. And if they want to just get information on what we're doing, they can come to our website. It's called Canadians.org. And we're, we've got tons of information on the international groups as well. So basically, inform yourself, organize, and mobilize. And, get, and, and, and find other people like yourself. Because if you're all by yourself, it's crazy making. When you work with other people, you can have fun and you can change the world. Mark Barley, author of Blue Future, Protecting Water for People and the Planet Ever. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And that's all from the team in Munich. I'm Zen Reza. Thank you for joining us.